Okay, so right now I am going to pass the presentation to our first speaker, Nick Ratch, and today he will be discussing about how to use uh, momentum in your trading, right? I am a fan of Nick work right he he shares stuff right based on numbers based on statistics right i have you know purchased his books i read his blog right so i'm a big fan of nick right and i'm happy to have nick today right to present to be the first speaker and i hope that you get as much value out of this presentation as i know that i'm going to get you know a ton of value out of his presentation so without further ado i'm going to pass the mic the presentation to nick and you know enjoy the show Perfect. Thank you very much, Raina. Very nice to be here. Just making sure everybody can hear me. If you just pop a yes in the chat box there, just so I know that I'm not speaking to myself. Perfect. That's great. Wonderful. And let me thank you all for coming. I know it's very early in the morning for some of you um, in the US and in Europe as well, but thank you very much for attending today. Um, I'm going to be talking about how to build a systematic relative momentum model. Um, Rainer asked me before we get on to that, just to speak a little bit about myself, to introduce myself, because a lot of you probably don't know who I am. As you can tell by my accent, I am in Australia. And I started trading in 1985, so just finished my 34th year of trading. Um, I started on the trading floor of the Sydney Futures Exchange and then I worked on dealing desks in Sydney, London and Singapore. For my first 17 years, I traded only futures and I actually ran my own futures hedge fund up until 2001 and then I switched into equities and I managed money up until 2016. Now, I trade six different systematic strategies. So, what that means, and we'll talk about this as we go through this, I don't look at charts or I don't draw any trend lines. There's no Fibonacci's or there's no chart patterns or anything like that. Uh, it's all algorithmic trading. I literally just put my account balance into the model, push the button, it generates the orders, does the position sizing and does everything else. And the six strategies that I trade encompass trend following, which we'll be talking about today, and also mean reversion. And I guess the way I like to talk about that is rather than run a portfolio of stocks that is common and what most people do, I run a portfolio of systems and they tell me what to buy and sell. So today I'm going to explain why I don't trust analysts or financial advisors or certain industry types. I'm going to explain to you why there's a very real casualness to risk and why that's dangerous, especially to new investors and traders, which I'm sure some of you are. I'm going to introduce you to systems trading and uh, literally show you the kind of things I do. And today I'm going to fully disclose a momentum strategy. Now, I personally trade two of these. And what you're going to be seeing today is not too far different from how I manage my own money and how I've done it for, for several decades now. Before I get into this, there's a couple of little things that I need you to understand before we go through. I'm going to offer you a special download link at the end of this presentation and that fully discloses another strategy that can be traded on global markets and I'll discuss that at the end. So wait on for that. And the next thing you should know is that, look, I don't use any text in my slides. So the idea here is that you actually listen in. If you just want to take screenshots, you're not going to get too much out of it because there's not much text. And it's just a way for me to get your attention. And it also enables you to ask me better questions at the end of the session. And by the way, I'm going to give you my personal email address at the end. So if you do have any questions that can't be answered in today's session, um, you'll be free to email me and I'll do my best to absolutely answer every single one of you. Alrighty. So let's get into this. There's a lot to go through here. I want to do a little bit of background before we get into this. Now, there's a lot of information flowing across the internet. Um, it's through social media. A lot of you would be on YouTube, uh, seen Rainer on Twitter, you've seen me on Twitter perhaps, and a lot of mainstream media. And thanks to the internet, it's actually never been easier to make money. But because of the internet, it's actually been very, very tough for people to stay focused on only one thing until you can get good to it. I call that the beginner's cycle. 
where we're just plowed with so much information, we just don't know which way to jump and it becomes very, very confusing and we go around and around in circles. And the other thing to consider, the amount of information available, yet there's so many traders, so many investors that still have no strategy and still continue to lose money. So that said, much of the information we do get onto the internet we come across as hearsay. Much of it's ill-informed. Now, to give you an idea, I used to be an anonymous source from the trading floor in Sydney when I worked down there. And one of the major financial newspapers would call me every single day and ask me what was going on. And many times, this journalist either didn't believe me or she just printed what she wanted to print in the paper the next day because rarely did it have anything to do with what I actually said. So you've just got to be careful of who you're listening to and what's going on. I guess in this day and age, I mean, that was back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and they call it fake news now, but it's really been around the whole time. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand that not all retail traders are swayed by what they read or hear, but many are. And then that begets the question, can we actually believe the professionals out there? Now, here's some data, and this is from the Australian market, but it is also applicable to the US market. I just didn't have time to put a slide together. And what this basically is, is the top 150 companies in Australia, the broker consensus. What I've done is I've taken any companies that don't have 10 analysts covering the stock, and I've removed any neutral and hold. And what we're left here with is 89 companies with directly conflicting outlooks from these analysts. So you can see here, some have got uh, big sells and big buys, yet they're all different. Now, to give you an idea of an analyst, a banking analyst doesn't look at airline shares. They don't look at um, tech stocks. They only look at banks. They live and they breathe banks. They don't do anything else. So how is it? that these highly paid analysts can be looking at the same banks, one comes up with a buy and one comes up with a sell. How is that possible? I'm going to explain that to you as we go through this. My point here at the moment is that we get very conflicting information from the so-called professionals in the business. And here's another very interesting one here. This here was analyst predictions at the start of 2019 for where US Treasury yields would be by the end of the year. Now you could see halfway through the year, every single one of them, every single one of them was completely wrong. So my point is that if these experts have no idea what's going on, how the heck are we supposed to have an idea? It basically shows how fruitless prediction is. Now, to give you an idea why these analysts get it so wrong, and many of you won't know this, but here's it, here it is straight from an insider. I have a friend who is a quant analyst at one of the big banks in Hong Kong. It's his job to put valuations on different companies. And the way he had explained it to me is there's 12 inputs into his valuation model. But here's the thing, eight of those 12 inputs are future forecasts. So future forecasts might be what he thinks interest rates are in a year, might be what the US dollar is in a year, might be what the price of gold is in a year. At the end of the day, eight of the 12 are a forecast and we know humans are very bad at making forecasts and that's exactly why all these different analysts either get a buy or a sell for the same stock even though they're looking at the exact same information. So what a lot of stuff we see out there in the market, another consideration we have to, have to take into account is a lot of the analysis, a lot of the advice that we get from our financial planners, from our stockbrokers, from whoever it is, is actually propelled by very common motherhood statements. We all know what these motherhood statements are can't time the market. The only free lunch is diversification. You should only buy low, sell high. Active investing is too costly. You know the kind of things I'm talking about, Warren Buffett, these kind of things that are very, very popular. They're so popular, they just take it for granted these days. But are they actually realistic in their, in their, in their views? Personally, I don't think so. 
this view that you can't time the market. I completely disagree with that. I've been doing it successfully for over 30 years. I think you can time the market. And a lot of this advice, the can't time the market, the only free lunch is diversification, you, can't, you must buy low and sell high, a lot of this is peddled by many in the financial industry and it's very, very generic and it's very, very easy for them to do this kind of stuff. And I understand the, rational, the rationality behind it. It's easy to understand, it's easy to sell to a client, it's easy to implement, it's easy to, to manage. And for the advisors out there who you might be taking advice from, well, that's a pretty safe bet for them, but it's not necessarily particularly safe for you. And why is that? Well, it means that a lot of the time, people will, will remain rational. And we know that's not the case. If buy and hold was such an easy thing to do and such a great thing to do, how is it that so many people lost so much money during the GFC? I have personal friends that lost everything and they were simple buy and hold investors. They were given advice from their advisors. Some of them lost 97, 98% of their assets very, very quickly. Now, what we're seeing at the moment, and this is what worries me, what we're seeing at the moment across the world is stock markets hitting all-time highs. And that brings a lot of casualness to the equation. Casualness to risk, casualness to returns, especially for new people that weren't around 10 years ago. I've been around for a long time. I lost everything in 1987, but I survived the tech crash. I survived the big bear market in 02, 03, or 01, 02, and I certainly survived the GFC. Um, but we're seeing a lot of people new to the market and they're not going to survive the next time it comes around unless you get a strategy, which is what I'm going to talk about today. That said, if you're happy to believe those motherhood statements, if you're happy to believe that buy and hold is the best thing since sliced bread, go right ahead. That's up to you. But here's the thing. And this is what makes me somewhat different. Sorry, I've just flipped ahead a couple of slides there. What makes me very different is I need to know why and how I invest my money before I risk it. I need to know exactly what to do, how to do it, how many shares to buy, where I'm going to get out, et cetera, et cetera. I need structure. And more importantly, I need rigid evidence that what I'm doing will actually work over the longer term. If you go and see a financial planner or a stockbroker or an accountant and you say to them, prove to me your strategy will make me money, they're probably going to arm and ah and say, oh, well, this is how things are being done and everyone does it. And, but that's not evidence, okay? That's hearsay. I want evidence. I want hard statistical evidence. I need this set of guidelines to follow when stress increases and decision-making can become difficult. A good example, personally, we all remember when Donald Trump got elected a few years ago. I was 100% long US equities according to my models, 100% fully exposed across the board. And I sat here during my time zone and I watched the S&P 500 futures during the night session go limit down. Now, for the average person, they'd probably be choking and trying to hedge and do all sorts of stuff. You couldn't get out of a position because the market was closed. But that November, I finished the month up over 10% simply because I didn't need to panic. My decision-making processes were pre-planned because I had tested them over decades worth of data. And that's a very good example of just sticking with the system because you know that over the longer term, it's actually going to work in your favor. So if you're open to thinking independently or if you wish to differentiate yourself from the crowd, then the kind of strategy which I'm going to discuss here with you may well be for you. So what is a momentum system or what is a momentum model? A true trading system or a true trading model is one that is completely based on evidence. I like to call it evidence-based investing. You may have heard of that term in the past. Evidence-based investing is about developing very specific rules or repetitive tasks, if you like, that objectively make decisions and allocate my assets symmetrically or systematically. 
You can call it quant, you can call it algo. Either way, what I'm talking about here is a suite of decision-making processes that have been founded on hard data, not on some kind of a narrative. I don't care what a company does. All I wanna know is if I'm buying at a certain price, that the probabilities will be in my favor over the longer term. So I'm not trying to predict the future. I'm not investing on narratives. I'm using hard data. It's a well-known fact that many of the top investors and hedge fund managers use these very same principles, these evidence-based strategies. Harding, Renaissance, D.E. Shaw, Graham Capital. If you haven't read the Jim Simons book that's just come out recently, take a read of that. The guy is the greatest investor in history. Absolutely blows Buffett away by a long way. And he does it all this exact same way that I'm talking about here. So what differentiates their strategies from these standard finger in the air narrative type strategies that we tend to hear about? Well, firstly, the rules we adhere to are all encompassing and they're dynamic. So rather than lean solely on diversification as an example for risk control, diversification is just simply a part of the broader equation from controlling risk. And what I mean by that is actually getting out of the market could be a very good way to avoid damage. In 2008, during the GFC, for example, I was completely out of some of my portfolios for the whole year. Some of the other portfolios exited in June. And as a result, I sat there for most of the year sitting in cash and not worried about the world completely failing around me. Okay, that is a measure of risk. That is a position. No position is a position. The other second thing is these objective rules that I'm gonna be talking about today, they can be fed into a computer. And when you have an extensive database, um, the output from that algorithm or those algorithms will provide a reasonably good indication of what the strategy can and can't do. And that's what's important to me. I need to know ahead of time, what's my annual return? What's my drawdown? How many trades am I going to make? How long will it take me to get out of a drawdown? These kind of information gives me confidence to pull a trigger. And without that, I probably couldn't. And for a lot of people, uh, a lot of people can't pull a trigger if they're in doubt. So let's get into this now. What I'm about to show you here is an exceptionally robust strategy that you can use on equities, ETFs, commodities, indices, FX, whatever you want. It works across the board. It can be adjusted to hands-on actively, i.e., weekly, or it can be very hands-off, say monthly, or extremely hands-off, say quarterly. The ones I'm gonna show you here are monthly, and the two I trade are monthly. As I said, what I'm gonna show you here is very, very close to what I personally do. So, first of all, what is momentum? Very simply, momentum is price persistence. Markets, and specifically individual stocks, manifest themselves in trends. And don't get me wrong, trends don't exist in all stocks all of the time, but they do exist in most stocks some of the time. I would challenge you to bring up a price chart from the 50s or the 60s or the 70s and show me uh, where trends don't exist. They have to exist, they can't not exist. To say a trend doesn't exist would suggest to me that the market is perfectly priced and that there is absolutely no personal sentiment from the participants. And we know that's impossible. So simply put, price momentum tends to persist long enough to exploit and profit from. That's what we're after here. That's basically all we're after. Now here's a little bit of research and what you're gonna see here, and I'll, I'll refer to some of this at the end of our talk, there is a lot of academic white papers out there and they all lead to the same thing. Um, here's research that extends back to the 1800s and it shows the excess return of buying the top third strongest stocks 
versus buying the worst third. And you can see there that the top third, the blue line, clearly shows an upward trend and high, probabil uh, high profitability over time. But if you buy the bottom third, you can see it's a losing proposition. Now, this was a very similar kind of um, test that I did in my book, Unholy Grails. In fact, if any of you have Unholy Grails, it's on page four. It basically compared the returns of buying uh, stocks that are breaking out of a 250-day high compared to buying stocks that are buy, uh, breaking down in a 250-day low. There is a clear edge in buying the strength rather than buying the weakness. And this is a compelling argument for what's known as momentum. Now, there's two types of momentum, absolute and relative. So when we look at an individual stock on its own, this is an Australian stock, this is called absolute momentum. In other words, we're looking at the stock on its own accord without reference to anything else. So classic trend following strategy, some of you may have heard about the turtles um, or Davis box or whatever it may be, even basic technical chart patterns, that would be looking at an absolute stock, the stock on its own without reference to anything else. But what I'm going to be talking about here today is what's known as relative momentum. And this is when you compare the momentum of one stock to that of another or to a universe of stocks. So for example, if we're talking about S&P 500 stocks, we might be saying, well, how strong is Amazon compared to everything else in the S&P 500, rather than how strong is Amazon on its own, all right? So that's what we're gonna be talking about, what's called relative momentum, and that's the comparison of one stock versus everything else in a particular universe. So when we're looking at momentum, we wanna pick a time window, okay? We wanna see what the strength of a stock is over a certain window of time. That can be three months, it can be 12 months. Most academic studies tend to focus on 12 months, which is exactly what I do. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. So select a look back period. That's your first step to building this kind of a model. So our look back period is going to be 12 months. Now, the $64 million question is how do we measure momentum? Now, basically, momentum is the price gain over that period of time, in our case, over the last 12 months. So that's called the rate of change. And that's what I use, but other people use something different. Andreas Klenau, who some of you may have heard, he's just recently been speaking up in Asia. He uses linear regression as an example. There's plenty of ways to measure price changes over a period of time. But personally, I use rate of change. <coughs> Excuse me. Now then what we do is we measure all the stocks in our universe and then we rank them. And the simple way to do that is via the rate of change for that price period. So the stock that has the highest rate of change over the last 12 months gets ranked number one. Um, our research also suggests that you can divide that momentum with the volatility of the stock as well. And again, you would rank it. So stocks with the highest rate of change and the lowest volatility would be ranked the highest. So the next step is to decide how many shares to buy. And to do that, we there's a few ways to do that. Um, one way, a popular way, is to take into account the volatility of the underlying security. And basically what this comes down to is the more volatile the stock, the less you buy, and the lower the volatile the stock, the more of it you would buy. So we equalize the position based on the volatility. Now, that's one way to do it. Uh, one of my models does it that particular way. And the other way is you can use an equal weighting method. So for example, you might want to have 10 positions and each position is allocated 10% of the available capital. So my other model operates on that basis. Two different models doing slightly two different things give slightly two different results, okay? Um, 
There have been various studies that show that the equal weight allocations do actually outperform. Um, this is explained by skew. I don't want to get too technical on you, but that's when you get very large positive returns on just a few stocks, which will offset the modest or negative returns on sort of the average stock. Um, so there's two ways to do it. I do each and I simply do each on the different models simply for diversification purposes. That's the whole idea. I don't try and optimize it. Okay, now we've all heard of the phrase a rising tide lifts all boats and a falling tide tends to drop all boats. This is an incredibly important step in the whole equation. Now, don't get me wrong, during the GFC, some stocks did rise, but by and large, the extreme majority of stocks fell. So, this particular rule is to get involved in the market, we want to use a two-step approach. We want to ask the question, is the broader trend of the market up? If it's yes, then we want to invest. If it's no, we don't want to invest. And that's the exact reason why I didn't participate in a lot of the in a lot of the downside in 2008. Some of my systems, as I said before, were 100% cash. It wasn't because I was smart. It wasn't because I predicted what was going to happen. It was simply, and this sounds incredibly simple, but it's true. The market trend was down. I was sitting in cash, waiting for that trend to turn up. So if the broader trend is up, yep, I'm involved, like I am now. I'm 100% invested for one reason the broader market trend is up. I don't know how long that's gonna last. It could last a day, a week, a month, another 10 years, I don't know. But whilst it's up, I'm gonna stay invested. If it does turn down, I'm gonna get out. And there's a lot of empirical evidence supporting this fact. And again, I stress it and show you a lot of tests in my book, Unholy Grails. Then the next step, what we wanna do here is we want to ask the same question of the individual stock. So our first question is the broader market up or down? Then we say the same thing to the individual stock. Is the trend of this individual stock up or down? If it's up, yes, we want to invest. And if it's no, we don't want to invest. And this is where my momentum models get a little bit different from what you can read about in academic papers. Academic papers, will continually invest regardless of whether this, um, the stock market itself is going up or down or whether the stock price itself on the individual stocks is going up or down. I don't do that. I want them all to be going up. But a lot of the white papers, they'll invest all the time. Now, why would you go long stocks that are in a sustained bear market? It makes no sense to me. So that's that very, very easy rule. And uh, we can discuss these in the Q&A at the end. And the last thing to do is to actually execute these, these rules, okay? Now, you can do it weekly. I prefer to do it monthly. I can't see any evidence that doing it earlier than a month makes any difference whatsoever. There's no empirical evidence that I can come up with that shows there's a benefit to doing it. So literally what that allows me to do is rank the top stocks after the close of business on the last day of the month. So what are we coming up to um, end of December? So after the close of business on the 31st of December, I'll run these models. They will measure the rate of change of these markets for the last 12 months. They will then rank those stocks in order of that strength. Then the system will ask the question, is the market going up? And it is. And then it will ask the question, are these individual stocks going up? And if they are going up, then I buy the strongest ones. Simple as that. And then I just repeat that every single month. It's as simple as that. Repeat from step two. And there's going to be plenty of times for question and answers uh, later on with this. Um, so just make sure you write down any kind of questions or queries you have. And as I said, my email address will be available at the end and you're more than welcome to send me an email to ask and clarify. So to give you an answer, here's uh, some of the top Australian stocks. It works exactly the same for every other market in the world. Doesn't matter if you're in India, doesn't matter if you're in Belgium or the US or Canada, it's going to be exactly the same. So here's a lot, list of the top 20 stocks in the ASX 100 measured by their momentum. And um, what we've got here, this is uh, using ranking that divides their momentum by volatility. And 
In this particular case, for example, let's say we wanted to have a concentrated portfolio of just 10 positions. And what we do here is we take that top one, which is ticker FMG, it's ranked number one, and it's saying there that I wanna buy 10.54% of my portfolio money to buy that stock. And then with AST, it's obviously not as volatile. I would buy 13.4% of that. And I go down the list until I've spent 100% of my money. Okay. So the major differences here is the more volatile the stock, the less you will buy it. The less the volatile the stock, the more you will buy it. And that will change on a regular basis. And you can adjust that. Personally, I don't, but some people do. I just buy the position and let it sit until I get an exit. Now, some of you probably just have a question on that. Um, you're probably going to say to me, well, how do you exit a position? That's a good question. Well, you exit the position when it falls out of that top 10 ranking. So say, for example, here, I buy stocks 1 through 10 on this list. So FMG all the way down to QUB. I hold them for a month, and the next month I do the same exercise. Now, if... QUB drops to number 11 and GPT comes up to number 10. Well, I sell QUB and I buy GPT and I continue to hold all the other ones. So you're just repeating this process and what you're automatically doing is holding the strongest stocks all the time. You're never holding a weak stock. You're always holding the strongest stocks. So we're always buying that strength. Okay, so... We can feed these rules into a computer. Now, for your information, the software that I use is AmiBroker. Uh, earlier on in my career, I used TradeStation, but I moved across to AmiBroker when I started trading equities. Uh, I like the platform. Um, it's pretty simple to use. It gives you a, a blank piece of paper, a blank slate, and it does exceptionally good uh, on portfolio testing across many universes of stocks. So what we've done here is put the rules into the system back to 2000 and we've tested it on the top 500 Australian stocks, which is the All Lords Accumulation Index. And you can see here, if you had followed these rules over that period of time for the last 20 years, you would have had a return of 15.7% versus buy and hold of 8.6%. And you can see in 2008 and 2009, the portfolio flatlined. And this is exactly what my portfolio do. I just sat in cash for that whole period of time. No pain, uh, no nerves, just able to sit there. Now, there's two important upside rules, for that, well, not rules, but two important upsides for that. First of all, you don't lose money. That's always a good thing, okay? I haven't met too many people that enjoyed losing 30, 40% of their money that they had in mutual funds. Yeah, some of those mutual funds came good again, but that was a very, very uncomfortable period of time. Now, don't get me wrong. I lost money in 2008 in some of my portfolios. One was 13%. Others, I lost nothing. So that put me in a very strong financial position, which in turn put me in a very strong psychological position to pull the trigger again in 2009 when the market started going up. Now, a lot of people, even today, that lost a lot of money back in the GFC, even today, 10 years later, they cannot get involved. They're too scared to get involved because they lost so much money. So if you have a mechanism to protect the downside, you're going to be more able to get involved and make money when the market's uh, running up. So you can see here on the Australian market, it looks pretty good in terms of return. Don't get me wrong, we're not hitting the baseball out of the park. That's what I'm not about. If you were coming here expecting to make 200% per year returns or 15, 20% monthly returns, well, that's not what I'm about. When you're trading six figures, seven figures, you just want to chip away with good returns like this over the longer term and compounding will do its thing. Okay, so the other thing we get from uh, putting this data or generating this data is not only we can see the equity growth, we can see the drawdowns, we can see exposure, we can even go down to sector exposure, all that kind of stuff. I can give you all sorts of statistics. For example, I can tell you that this strategy has only ever had three losing years since 2000. 
It makes money in 75.2% of all months. The average losing month is 2.9%. The average winning month is 3.8%. And the maximum amount of losing months in a row is four. So with that information, you can arm yourself and have confidence that, you know, one thing I see is people start my strategies and they have two losing months and they say, gee, Nick, this is not going very well. It doesn't work very well. Maybe I should go and do something else. But if you know there's a chance of having four losing months in a row, well, you're in a better position to just hang out and just let it do its thing. Okay, and when you're trading discretionarily, you can't actually do that because you don't know. There is no solid evidence of what can and cannot happen. The most important thing, believe it or not, is the drawdown. So with a drawdown, that's how much your account will decline at any given point of time. Every single strategy on the planet has some kind of a drawdown at some stage. If you're Warren Buffett, if you're Jim Simons, Whoever you may be, the turtles, whatever, you're always going to be a drawdown. There's always going to be a drawdown. If someone tells you they don't have a drawdown, well, sorry, they're bullshitting to you. They're absolutely lying. So this is a fact of trading that at some stage, you're going to have an uncomfortable period of losing money. And what differentiates a professional trader like me to an expert, uh, to a, an amateur, is that I expect it's going to happen and I'm ready for it when it happens, and I allow it to happen without changing strategy, and I see through the other side. So here again is the same strategy on the same market, the ASX, and you can see here that the strategy has a drawdown of 22.1%. Now, some of you may think, oh, that's pretty extreme. Well, when you compare it to buy and hold, it's less than half. So it is a lot better than buy and hold. And don't forget, we had a return that almost was as twice as good. So when we look at risk adjusted return, the strategy is significantly better than buy and hold. I'm not saying it's not painless. There is some pain involved. There's always pain involved with good things, but you've got to get through it. It's no different going to the gym or losing weight. There are uncomfortable periods of time. It's the same with trading. Okay. Here's the periods of time where the positions uh, go into cash. Now, I haven't added any interest into these equations. So in actual fact, you would get a little bit of return on your money from earning interest, or you could put it into a bond ETF or something like that. Now, this portfolio has only been invested 70% of the time and it will sit through extended bear markets. And don't get me wrong, that can be difficult for some people. When we started our service back in 2006, some of our investors in 2008 wanted to know why we're sitting in cash. Why are we paying you? We're doing nothing. It was only until the end of the GFC when the market had tanked so far that they realized the benefits of actually doing that. And obviously they were pretty happy about it. So for some people, it can be quite frustrating sitting there doing nothing. And for a lot of people, you wanna be busy. You wanna be doing stuff, but sometimes doing nothing is the right thing to do. So let's put the same strategy, the exact same rules on the S&P 500. Exact same rules, 200 day rate of change. And there we go. So we've got a 14.6% return compared to a buy and hold return of 5.8%. Now, when you put the strategy in a completely different market and you get a good result, you know the strategy is robust. And same with the drawdowns. When we look at the drawdowns, you can see here that the S&P 500 had a drawdown of over 50% during uh, 2008. Um, this strategy, and this is real data, is going through this current drawdown at the moment. We're down around 13.3%. Not nice, but it happens. Um, and that was mainly due to fourth quarter last year. Uh, where we had that big route. Now, I was out of the market in December, but I was in the market in November when there was a big rotation out of momentum stocks. And yeah, I got knocked around quite a bit. But uh, hey, that's life. That happens. If you trade long enough, you're going to get a smack around the face by Mr. Market to tell you to um, show a bit of humility. Um, so you just got to take it easy with the risk. That's all. So we've got the same strategy in two totally different markets and we're seeing some pretty good results across the board. Now that's called robustness, but I wanna show you robustness 
in a different way. Bear with me here. What we've got here is a simple moving average crossover strategy, okay? A simple moving average crossover strategy. And we test that strategy in two different periods of time, 1992 through to 2007, then from 2007 through to 2015. And we look at crossovers between 30 and 200 days. Now, on the left of this chart, 1992 to 2007, you can see all those are profitable. It's not particularly good looking. It's a little bit lumpy there, especially around that 40, 50, 60 area at the start, uh, and then it fades on out. Now, that's not particularly robust. In other words, if the market changes character, which the markets always do over time, then you might find that if you say use a 50 day crossover or 50 day breakout, which has been really good in the past, it might not start working. It might not work very, very well into the future. If we look at the same numbers between 2007 and 2015, you can see almost every single parameter is actually a losing proposition. So what was reasonably okay between 1992 and 2007 has not worked since 2007 in any way, shape or form. In other words, what I'm saying is a very basic moving average crossover system is not particularly robust. So let's compare that with our momentum model. So here you can see 1992 to 2007. And what we're doing here is looking at the look back periods we talked about. So in our model, we used a 200 day look back, but here we test every look back period from 50 days out to 300. And we do that between 1992 and 2007. And then again, between 2007 and 2015. The big difference here is you can see that both of them are very, very profitable, okay? The, the out of sample period of time is still particularly profitable, regardless if we use 50 days, 100 days, or even 260 days, they're all profitable. And that's what's important because what happens over time, markets slightly change their characteristics. A very good example of that, real time example of that is the turtles. We all know that the turtles used to trade a 200 day, a 20 day breakout back in the day, back in the seventies and eighties. But today there's still a few turtles out there trading. They use much longer term breakouts. So over time they have slowly adjusted to markets changing their personality. So you can see here the benefits of this robust type of strategy that if the market changes over time, you're still going to be making money. All right, we're almost at the end. So let's have a look at some fours and against of using momentum. First of all, the fours. It's been validated by very extensive and potent academic research. There's a ton of uh, white papers out there. Um, if you want to hear from some, just drop me an email. I'm happy to pass it on. There's several books out there. Stocks on the Move by Andreas Kleno, I've mentioned. Dual Momentum by Gary Antonacci. Relative Strength Strategies for Investing by Meeb Faber. There's a lot of them out there. Take a read of them. They're very, very good. Momentum keeps you invested in the strongest markets or the strongest sectors or the strongest stocks without you having to even think about it. You don't have to predict what's down the track. You're automatically going to be in the strongest stocks full stop. Okay. And a good way to think about that. This may sound like a pretty dumb kind of statement, but let's just say, let's just say at the end of 2020 in one year's time, Let's say gold is going to be at $10,000. How many gold stocks would you want in your portfolio? Would you want one? Would you want as many as you could get? Or would you like some bank stocks in there as well and some um, agricultural stocks and that kind of stuff? Well, if you knew for certain that gold was going to be at 10000 bucks, you'd want to be all in. You want your whole account in gold stocks because that's the way you're going to make the maximum amount of money. So what I'm saying here is if you stay invested in the strongest markets without having to predict, you're always going to be sort of ahead of the game, okay? These kind of strategies reduce your exposure to sustained bear markets. We've seen what happens uh, and it will keep you out of, uh, out of favour sectors as well, okay? If, if gold goes down for the next year, well, 
you're not going to be buying gold stocks. You don't want to be buying gold stocks if gold is going down. You can't make money buying gold stocks if gold is going down. So this will automatically reduce your exposure to any sector or any stock that's going down. Remember, one of our rules was the stock had to be trending up. It's completely systematic and I'd like to say non-emotional. Non-emotional is probably not the key. I certainly can have a few sleepless nights. Um, you know, November 2016 election with Trump is probably a, a very sleepless night for me, fully exposed S&P limit down. Who knows, that could, have, that could have completely gone the other way. So the portfolio and volatility dynamically adjusts and rebalances and it's minimal workload. Now I've said half a day a month there or half a day a quarter. Well, I'm lying. I'm probably spending probably on these particular models maybe half an hour, not half a day, once a month, literally half an hour. Obviously there's 30 years of research and development gone into that stuff. But hopefully, you know, with uh, what you've seen today, you can fast track your way through that a little better than what I have. But let's have a look at some of the things that are difficult. Um, first of all, buying strength. It's quite difficult for a lot of people. Um, not necessarily people that have been involved in the markets, but for the average punter out there, buying strength and then selling when a stock goes down tends to be a little unnatural. Sometimes, and this year is actually one of those times, it can underperform all right i'm underperforming the s p 500 this year uh it's the first time in about 10 years i've underperformed there are a couple of reasons for that if we look back to january this year remember q4 last year we had a big tank the market tanked and i went into cash and the market didn't tweak to my bullish trend until march so the market really started almost rallying from january the first it ran, rallied very hard in January, February and through March and I only got involved in March. So I was actually sitting out for a lot of this year's returns in those first two or three months. Um, there's a couple of other reasons, but that was the major one. Um, it can be commission sensitive. I use a deep discount broker in the US and I know you're gonna ask the question, so I'll tell you who I use. I use interactive brokers. Um, and I use interactive brokers for all my active strategies, both, um, both here in Australia and in the US. So depending on the broker that you use and depending on the rebalancing, it can be a little bit commission sensitive. Um, the average hold period tends to be about three times the rebalance. So what that means, if you're rebalancing every month, then your average hold period will tend to be roughly three or four months. Now, that means that you may have tax considerations that you have to take into account. Now, there can be arguments, especially from traditional accountants and, and whatnot, saying, oh, you know, you've got to hold for 12 months to get down that tax. Well, I don't agree with that. Um, I look at tax as kind of like advertising in a business. If you advertise in your business and it adds value to your bottom line, well, why wouldn't you advertise? Yes, it's an expense, but it's adding value to your bottom line. If you have an active strategy here that's making double the market return and taking you, you know, half an hour once a month, well, it's probably in your best interest to keep going with that. There are also vehicles that enable you to decrease your tax. For example, in Australia, and it's different for every other country, but I use family trusts and I use my retirement account. Both of those have very favourable tax um, conditions and that's why I use those. Um, I also use a company account so nothing in my personal name in any way shape or form. Alrighty so as I said uh, feel free to email me if you want some of those white papers or some of those published texts. Now on to um, the end of my slides here before we get on to the question and answer and I want to thank you for your attendance. I know you're going to have a lot of questions. And as I said, there's my email address. If you want to shoot me an email on any kind of question, I'm going to do my best to answer every single one of them. But what I'd like to do here is thank you for your attendance by offering up a, another um, ebook of mine that fully outlines another very robust strategy. It's called The Weekend Trend Trader. Um, it's, it follows trends on weekly timeframes. I know for a fact that this is traded in Australia, in the US, Brazil, 
South Africa, Hong Kong. It's traded in China. It's traded in Canada. They're all the countries that I'm aware that this strategy is traded on. And it's also a very popular strategy with my students who have completed the uh, trading system mentor course as well. Very, very robust kind of strategy for trading equities. So if you go to that link, you can get that ebook delivered to your inbox immediately. So go and grab that ebook today. And as I said, if you've got any questions about this presentation, about anything I do, about my training system mentor course, just hit me up on that email and I will reply to you. So thank you very much for your time. Um, that's 50 minutes, so we've got good time here for some questions. Um, and that would be fantastic. So, uh, Rainer, if you want to take on over again. Okay, thank you, Nick, for your presentation. And for those of you who, who, are, who have not downloaded the ebook, right? I'll be honest, I have actually paid money on Amazon. It's on Amazon, right, Nick? The, it, it costs money on Amazon. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, I, have I, can, paid refund, money. I can refund you if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no worries about that, right? I have paid money to get that book, and Nick is offering he, here for free for attendance on Traders Fair. So, it's a no-brainer that you should go down to the website, download that guide for free when I actually paid money for it, right? So that's the, the thing that, that I want you all to do right now. And also, right, we have some time for Q&A. Okay, so for those of you who have questions, right, type it into the chat box, right? And I will help facilitate this Q&A session. And the link is over here for you all to download. All right, do it concurrently as well. Uh, okay, someone said the website doesn't work, right? So uh, service unavailable, right? Nick, you might want to check into it. Uh, so it's www.thechartist.com.au uh, forward slash Traders Fest. There is a www ahead of that. Okay. Might you want to edit the slide so they can uh, kind of, you know, see it? Uh, yeah. All right. Might have crashed if there's that many people going to it. So what I would suggest, keep trying. If you can't get it, send me an email and I'll, um, I'll lock it in for you. No problems whatsoever. There's my email address. I know that works. Don't crash it. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to the the Q and A, right? To help uh, to answer some questions that we might have. I think I saw uh, one of it, right? So the, the do okay. There's a good, there's a good there's a good one right there from Simon. Um, do you add a filter to your momentum system that you will only invest when the market is up? Yes, we covered that. Um, so the question might be, what would you do? How would you do that? Very simple, Simon, and for everyone else. Just add a moving average to the underlying market. So, for example, if you're trading the US market, let's say you're trading the S&P 500, just add a 200-day moving average to the S&P 500. If the close of the S&P 500 index is above that, well, then the market is bullish. If it's below that, the market is bearish. Simple as that. It doesn't have to be any more complex than that. Okay, that's, uh, that's the first one. Okay, uh, next one, right, for you, Nick, is from Jason. Jason has three questions. So the first question Jason has for you is, does the system do well just the same on weekly time frame instead of monthly? Yeah, again, that was covered um, in, the, uh, in the discussion. Um, there is not a great deal of difference in the risk return profile of the strategy, whether you do it weekly, fortnightly or monthly. Where you will get the big difference is one, workload, two, commission. Because if you're rebalancing on a weekly basis or readjusting your positions on a weekly basis, you're going to be paying a lot more commission. And that may or may not add up over time depending on it. So. I didn't see any benefit from doing it any earlier on a month-to-month -month basis. Okay. And uh, again, the second question from the same person, Jason, he asked that, you know, given this performance, right, do you still look into developing the system further, right? Like trying other variations of it, uh, adjusting a parameters or maybe setting a stop loss for stocks like, you know, 10% stop loss, etc. Okay. In terms of research and development, that's really all I do. Okay, I spend my days doing that. I do not watch live data. If someone wants to come and watch me in my office, you're going to be totally bored because I'm rarely here. I'm researching and developing. Um, 
And yes, I don't know any, everything, absolutely not. And I'm still learning from people out there. I do a lot of reading and I put stuff to the test. And yes, if I can find things that will improve my strategies, then I will implement them. But, you know, I'm pretty rigorous in understanding exactly what, why and how. I have certainly made changes. I know uh, I made a, a, a a change to my main ASX trend following system back around 2015, which made a big difference. And again, that was just from something I learned from someone else, put it to the test. So yes, I continue to, uh, to research um, and make changes. I don't make that many changes, but I do continue to research. Okay. And uh, the third question from Jason again, he's, I think, I think you answered that previously, but I'll just repeat it once again, right? He said, how do you specifically identify if a market is in an uptrend? Do you use moving average year on year, et cetera? Yeah, that's all you've got to do. So we use the two filters, right? One for the broader market. So say again, the example, the S&P 500, you would add a 200 day moving average to the S&P 500. If the market is above that, the trend is up. If the market is below that, the trend is down. And on the individual symbol, here's a rule of thumb, listen for it. The individual symbol use half the length of the universe symbol. So for example, if you're using 200 days on the S&P 500 as the broader market, use 100 days on the individual symbol itself. So if Microsoft is above its 100 day moving average, then the trend is up. If it's below its 100 day moving average, then we'll define the trend is down. Okay, yep, that, that, uh, that's an interesting one. And I'm uh, moving on, right, uh, Nick, uh, do you see any questions that you would like to answer or do you want me to still uh, look through the questions and help for um, Let me it? just have a quick look here. Um, can it be used on the Indian market? I have no doubt it could be. I have never tested on the Indian market, but you would have to um, go and do the testing. Um, um, look, that's like everything else, you know, same with foreign exchange. I only trade stocks. That's all I do now. As I said, when I started, I did 17 years of trading futures, but now I only trade stocks and I only trade the Australian and US markets, not for any other reason than they're the ones I prefer to trade. So yes, I have no doubt it can be uh, worked on other markets, including India. So it's just a matter of testing it out and, uh, and having a go at it. Okay, I think there's one uh, quite uh, interesting one. He says uh, something like, I think it's from Simon, right? Uh, if a stock comes up in the top 10 and you're supposed to buy, but the corresponding sector's index is bearish, right? Do you reject that stock? So one of the rules is not a sector rule, unless you have that as a rule. Um, uh, I'm just getting this website fixed up. Um, the rule is that if the broader market is up, then we would buy. Okay, so if the broader market is down, we wouldn't even be buying. So you wouldn't even go to the next stage and look at the individual stocks. Okay, and uh, I see, okay, some, some, I think some of the questions is uh, about the website. So, okay, that I think that's yeah. uh, fixing. I'm right sorry now. about that. I'm not quite sure what's happened with that, but obviously it's crashed. Everyone's got the address. That's going to be available for everybody indefinitely. So it's yeah. not like in an hour or two hours is going to okay. be gone and not available, but I'm happy to, to, um, to send the, um, an e via email as well. Um, do we have a couple of questions, uh, a few more minutes for a few more questions? Yep. Uh, yep. We have uh, another 10 more minutes, right? There's a lot of questions that I'm filtering it. Right? Uh, one okay. more, right? From Sandeep who asked, can you explain ROC in short, which was in the table you, you showed, right? So ROC stands for rate of change. And it is simply the percentage change of a stock price between two different points of time. In our example, we were using 200 days. So uh, it would be the difference of a stock price between day one and day 200 in percentage terms. So if stock uh, ABC has gone up, uh, say, 25% and stock XYZ has gone up just 20%, then stock ABC has a stronger rate of change, a stronger momentum, and therefore it would be ranked higher than XYZ. Okay. And... Uh, Another one from Jordan. I think this, uh, this question, I think is more of a, but I'll just read out the question. He says, uh, how do you determine the exact <coughs> ranking of each stock? Like what you shared earlier on the uh, table. Uh, I think he said that he know that the least volatile stocks are the ones that you're looking for with uh, momentum will be the, the stocks that you favor. But is there like a, a formula 
uh, to calculate it exactly how do you actually rank these stocks. Uh, maybe an example for Jordan to kind of, you know, explain the... Sure. Test. So you could have a look, for example, at the um, average true range of that stock over the last, you know, 100 days or over the last 200 days. I use the same length. Um, as per what my look back for the rate of change is, which as I've said is 200 days. So we would look at the average true range of the stock over the last 200 days. Now that's a pretty flat way to look at it. It gives you a broader sort of guideline, but if you wanted to be a little bit more specific, you would certainly cut that down and say, righto, uh, what, because I rank the stocks every month, um, you could have potentially look at it every 20 days, which is, you know, which is 20 trading days and you could do it every single month. You'd redo that volatility and you could do it that way, but just use the ATR. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be overly complex, simple works. What makes money is the long-term application of a simple, robust strategy. That's what makes the money here. Yep. I totally agree with that. And uh, a question from Arshad who asked, right, do you exit all positions as soon as the broader market goes below the 200 day moving average or do you wait for the end of the month before you exit? Yep. Great question. Fantastic question. And the answer is we only run the system once a month. So the answer is at the end of the month. So yep. If it goes down on the fifth day of the month, you've got a lot of hanging around waiting to go. And that's what happened in October last year. Um, it happened very early in the month and that's why the month was a little bit painful, but, um, you know, as I said, it's one of those things that happens, um, but we must wait to the end of the month. That's what the rule is. Okay. And moving on from Pritam who asked you, right, uh, how can we use this strategy on the short side? Have you back tested it on the short side of the market? Uh, I have done research on trading in the short side. Um, two things. One, the strategy works and is profitable, but not to the point where I'd actually pursue it. In other words, the amount, it makes money, but the amount of return and the amount of drawdown and the amount of work is just not worth it, in my view. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing, and possibly more importantly, is that, and this is different for every country, but during the GFC, Australia and to a certain extent, some parts of the US banned short selling. Australia completely banned short selling. Now, what's the point of having a strategy that when you most need it, you can't use it? So I have not traded on the short side since 2008. What I did was develop strategies that profit from volatility and so when the market becomes very, very volatile, which tends to be during those events, those big downside events in 2008, they start making money. But they're long only strategies, but they're based on volatility. So it's a different kind of a strategy. But no, I don't trade these kind of strategies on the short side personally. I just sit in cash. Okay. And uh, next one, right? That's a, quite an interesting question he asked uh, from Markers. Uh, why are you called the chartist when you don't use charts, right? Did you pre previously use to use charts? <laughs> yeah, look, you're quite right. You caught me out there. Um, so I've always been a systematic trader, but um, we do do classical technical analysis. It has something that I've always done in the past. It was the foundation of our business originally, um, over 20 years ago. Um, but because I do a lot of the systematic stuff, a lot of our clients took a, a, a good interest in that. Um, so really our service is divided into two parts. We've got the classic technical analysis, um, which is done. I've got staff that do that stuff. And then we've got the algorithmic stuff as well. So everyone's a little bit different. Not everyone is into this algorithmic stuff. Certainly two of my staff members who work for me, they don't do any of that algorithmic stuff. They like looking at charts. They love Elliott Wave. They love Fibonacci. They love doing all that stuff. Um, and that's fine. You know, I'm not going to push it onto anybody, but certainly Many, many, many years ago when our business started, that was the foundation of it and we just have developed from that point of time. 
Yeah. Okay, cool. And and also, right, uh, just for the rest of the audience who are listening right now, I have seen some comments that they have people saying that they are have, they have managed to get the book. So for those of you who have not managed to download it, you can try the link and see if it's still working. And moving on, right, a question from Lokesh who asked, uh, how do you select the universe of stocks to trade? Uh, yep, good question. Um, well, personally, I stick to the highest liquidity stocks. Um, my account balance, you know, over the years has grown. So I trade the Russell 1000 in the US um, on one of my strategies. And I also trade the NASDAQ 100 in one of my strategies. And in Australia, I only trade the top 500 stocks in Australia. So I'm looking at the more liquid, more liquid stocks, um, not any liquid. So I don't go and trade out in the Russell 2000 or anything like that. Okay. And uh, where was that question? Uh, Jonathan, right? Jonathan asked, he said that, you know, I've heard you mention a regime filter, right? Could you explain how this is used? So a regime filter is the filter we use to define the broader market trend. So uh, that was our first step. Um, uh, uh, sorry, our first step was the look back period. Then we wanted to ensure that the market, we were aligning ourselves with the broader market trend. So the regime filter tells us, is the broader market trending up? If yes, let's invest. If no, we won't invest. Okay. And uh, let's see, uh, what else? Oh, someone asked, right? I can't remember what's the name because the question moved too fast. Uh, the person asked, you know, what's the minimum, right, to invest in this type of, you know, strategies? Yep, good question, common question, and an important question because commission is a function of return. If your commission takes up too much of your trading capital, then, um, then it's going to be very, very difficult to make money. So... It depends on the commission you pay for your brokers. So I haven't traded the Indian market. I haven't traded the Belgian market or anything like that. So I can't comment or the South African market. In Australia, commissions are actually quite high. In the US, commissions are very, very low. So if you were to implement a strategy like this and you had limited capital, you would be best to go and trade it in the US market because commission drag is very important and it's a lot lower over there. So, you know, if, if you have a, say, a, a $5,000 account and you make 100 trades a year and your commission is $10 per trade, you're going to be paying out $2,000 a year in commission, $10 in, $10 out. Um, and you're therefore going to have to be making, you know, 25% per annum just to break even. Now, that's almost impossible. So you want to get that commission drag down as much as you can. So for example, uh, my commission drag in the Australian market, which is considered expensive, um, the commission drag I pay around about 0.4 of 1% per annum. So it's extremely easy for me to generate a positive return because I don't have that much commission drag to actually get over. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to, to the person sure. asking it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one, right, from Manoj, you ask how to mitigate the risk, right, that the top rank ROC stock has almost run through its momentum and will be over the cliff after one buys. Well, you can never know that. Simple. You can never know that in advance. That's some kind of prediction. You can never know what's going to happen. All we have is the information at hand right here, right now. Historically, from our testing, what it shows is that if we follow this process over the longer term, then should one of those stocks tank, then look, it'll hurt. But it's not going to derail the system completely over the longer term. Um, and to give you an example, that's, again, I'm going to talk about what happened to me personally in October last year because we saw some of those momentum stocks. Now, there was one, and I cannot remember the, the name of it in the US, ATVI, I think it was, one of them. Anyway, it dropped 50%. It had gone from something like 
$25 to $280 in a straight line, and in the space of three weeks, it dropped 35%. So you can't possibly know, and therefore you can't mitigate. The way you mitigate it is understanding that over the longer term, those things will occur. They'll occur randomly, but it won't be enough to derail the strategy. All right, and that's why we have a lot of different stocks on. You know, generally speaking, you'll have 15 to 20 positions in your portfolio. Um, and, you know, if you've got 5 or 7% of your capital allocated to that and that still drops 50%, well, you've only really lost 2.5% of your total capital, which in the scheme of things, it stings a little, but it's not going to take you out of business. So you can't mitigate it. This is a game of risk and managing the risk, and we do as much as we can, and that's why we get the confidence from the back testing. All right, fantastic answer. And, you know, uh, we will answer three more questions, right, before we let Nick off. And again, right, uh, Nick has broadcast his email address over there. If we fail to answer your questions, feel free to drop in an email. And also, based on the comments that I've received, right, the website should be working now, and you can download the ebook yep, right website's now working website's now working i'm sorry about that okay and the third question right the final three question right first one right is from uh pratik who asked right why is it that more volatile market has to be traded less isn't it true that it gives more profit even if it has a higher risk um so what we're trying to do i mean it's a two-edged sword but we're trying to equalize the risk though we're trying to ensure i talked about very briefly touched on what's called skew so we don't want one position to have such a big impact on the portfolio that it skews the return either positively or negatively so that's very very important and the way we do that is we uh, balance the volatility of the positions. And as a rule of thumb, a lower volatility stock will have a bigger position and a higher volatility stock will have a lower position and that balances up to some degree. It's kind of like fixed fractional position trading. You know, it's exactly the same kind of concept. Um, it just balances the risk up. Okay, and the second last question, right? Uh, it's This one is from Ashish, right? Who asks, how do you use volatility for your weighting in your portfolio i'm sorry how do i use volatility for my weighting i think he says uh, how do you use volatility for portfolio weightage i think uh, maybe how do you assign the weightage to individual stock based on volatility i think that's what he meant yeah well as i said the way we would do that as per the presentation was using the atr so i use 200 day atr because i'm using a 200 day look back and as a result, what you'd have is that um, the lower volatility stocks would get the higher weighting, sometimes, you know, 8, 9, 10%, and higher volatility stocks will get a lower weighting, and sometimes that can be 3 or 4% of the portfolio. So in a very high volatility period of time when all stocks are very high volatility, um, dare I say, that's assuming you would be in because generally speaking, when you get extreme high volatility, the market trend is down and you'll be out. But what that means is you'd have um, quite a lot of stocks in your portfolio. So say on average, I might have 15 in a very high volatility period. That might go up to 21, 22 because you've got a lot of stocks with a little bit of an allocation in there as opposed to a fewer stocks with a lot oh. of allocation. Okay, and... Uh, uh uh, this question is from my side, Nick. If I'm not wrong, you mentioned earlier that you, you consider both approaches, right? One, it's uh, using the uh, uh, fixed amount of capital and one is the volatility approach. And you said something along the lines that in the grand scheme of things, I think there really isn't one better than the other. Is that, is That's that right? what my research shows. And what I'm trying to do here, as I said in the start of the presentation, is not rely on a single strategy. So I tried six different strategies across two different markets and those six strategies are all different so for example my momentum strategies um, i trade two of them in the us one of them trades the nasdaq 100 and uses a fixed percentage allocation and the other one trades the russell 1000 and uses the volatility adjusted allocation so i'm focused on slightly different strategies trading slightly different parts of the market using different position sizing algorithms. And, you know, uh, 
over time that smooths the equity curve out. I combine that with another trend following strategy and also three mean reversion strategies as well. So the whole idea is I'm getting a good mix of different kind of strategies doing different things in different time frames in different markets. Okay, fantastic. And last question from Lokesh who asked, right, is there a minimum ROC that acts as a filter? For example, if none of the stock has moved up by say 10%, then you will not enter a trade at all. You could add a hurdle like that into it. And the standard answer for those kind of questions is you'd have to test it. Um, so certainly that would be a possibility that you would want the rate of change. For example, I require a rate of change to be above zero. Okay. So the, um, the question is, can it be above 10? Yes, that would be. And you would go and test that and you would see what impact that had on the returns. From a gut feel, what you would find in certain periods of time, you might not get enough signals. And so you might have a little bit of cash sitting there, which may dilute re your return, but certainly test it. That's the bottom line with all of this. Test it, test it, test it. Okay, thank you so much, Nick. Right, thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it as well as the audience. Right, so thank you so much, Nick. No problems. Thank you so much for having me, Rainer.